everyone. Uh, welcome to everyone who's tuning in uh, to our conversation today. It's really lovely to have you with us. Um, and hello to my fellow panellists. It's such a treat to um, uh, get to spend a bit of time with you uh, in this virtual sphere. Uh, my name is Liv Satchel. Uh, I'm tuning in today from Wondery Country and I'd like to uh, acknowledge the land on which I'm kind of working and living on and what an honour and privilege it is to be part of such an old storytelling tradition. Um, I'm going to kick us off just talking a little bit about uh, my practice, just like a brief introduction, and then I'll hand over to Marky and Eve to introduce themselves. Um, so uh, I work as a writer-director in theatre. Um, I did my Masters of Directing at BCA uh, across 2015 and 2016, and it was when I was doing a directing course that I realised that I actually wanted to write for theatre, classic. Um, <laughs> and... For my graduation project in 2016, uh, I uh, the show that I made was actually the first time I wrote and directed my own work. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was kind of a tiny three-night season at Little La Mama, um, the original Little La Mama when it was still around. And um, I felt like, it, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. It was a massive university experiment, but actually it kind of laid the groundwork for what is now my practice. So that play that I made then turned out to be actually the first of a trilogy of plays um, that I've been working on. And we did the last of them at the end of last year. Uh, and La Mama has just committed to presenting the three plays together in their own season next year at La Mama Courthouse, which is really oh, wow. wild and exciting and like pretty intense in the current environment um but I work like the, I work with a, the same ensemble of artists on this body of work and we're all really thrilled at this opportunity um but I guess like a broad way to describe the way that we work is that it's uh intense intensely collaborative um the scripts that I write are deliberately unfinished and we um uh finish them together as an ensemble in the rehearsal room and uh, my practice, I guess, really sits like somewhere in between uh, script script based writing and devising for performance because I, so far, I have found that's kind of the most that's the most uh, collaborative way to make work in the way that we want to make it. And it's kind of the best way to share authorship across our group. Uh, that's my potted summary. Mark, I might hold uh, throw over to you. Thanks, Liv. Hi, uh, and hi to everyone tuning in. I'm Maki, and today I'm dialing in from Lenape country, um, otherwise known as New York. Um, but normally I'm in Orange country, so I'd like to pay my respects to both places and the Indigenous people of uh, both of those locations and for the elders past, present, and emerging. And so I was never seated uh, in other spot and yeah so I uh, am a writer and performance maker um, primarily a playwright I would say um, but I guess there's so many crossovers um, and yeah. as a playwright there's always so many roles especially working with um, you know, new work and yeah but uh, working with um, directors normally I'm, I wouldn't call myself a director um, primarily a writer first and foremost uh, and a project I recently worked on was um, called Trash Pop Butterflies Dance Science Paradise which was uh, my graduating piece while studying playwriting at BCA as well mm. and yeah um, that was a difficult process I'm sure we'll get stuck into it later because um, <laughs> it was kind of you know it was like at the height of the pandemic and basically oh, it's part of no. Midsummer Festival got cancelled Still oh. working on, you know, um, putting it back on hopefully yeah. this year or next year. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> TBC. I feel like that's a great thing to cover though, right? Like so many writers yeah, totally. need to yeah. Yeah, stop, yeah. start. Mm. And what are you doing in the gaps? Uh -uh. For sure, for sure. See. And I'll throw it to you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, my name is Eve Blake, she, her. I'm, I'm also tuning in from Brondry Country. Um, and I also want to acknowledge sovereignty, never, never seen it, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, 
and my practice. Okay, so, well, I mean, nowadays I write for like film, TV and theatre. I think the best example that I can offer in the context of this chat is um, this musical that I wrote called Fangirls. Um, so my like career in my early 20s was always presenting work in fringe con uh, context. So mm. like solo shows, interactive pieces, uh, this like gamified meal that was like a food fight in a drained swimming pool. And then um, I started to developing this idea for this big glittery musical. And I understood that necessarily to kind of produce it at scale, I was going to need like main stage partners. And so mm. like I, at first I imagined that that was like completely outside the realm of possibility because um, like the indicators I saw was like, okay, I'm a fringe girl. Um, I produce in fringe context. I'm completely unproven in a main stage space. Also, musical theatre is so expensive. And when I oh. looked at um, precedent, it's like, well, the musicals that get made are based on existing like books or movies mm -hmm. or, um, you know, like existing juicy pieces of IP. And I mm -hmm. had an original musical that was no less about teenage girls. And also, like, if you look at the canon of musical theatre, until very recently, like most musicals, the big hit ones are written and directed by men. So I really thought I had no business getting it on, but over <laughs> a process of about, God, four or five years, mm. um, I, I ended up getting it put on in this like incredible co-production between Belvoir um, in Sydney, Queensland Theatre, Brisbane Festival and the Australian Theatre for Young People. That original season that went on at Queensland Theatre and Belvoir then returned for a, tour, a national tour in 2021 I went to a bunch of places, including Arts Centre Melbourne, and then came back for a third time uh, just very recently at the Sydney Opera House. Mm -hmm. So it's been very interesting because I suppose, like, the lens I can bring here is what happens when you've got, a, like, a fringe practice and mm -hmm. then you have something and you want to put it on in a main stage and, like, professional touring context. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, like, it was such an amazing... It was, like, incredibly educational process, understanding how to take a, a fringe product and pitch it in the yeah. context of companies that have got like like really big bottom lines in terms of how much yeah. money they have to make and how many people they have to get interested and like what obligations they have as a company and and yeah mm. I'm just really I, I'm interested to talk about that yeah well maybe we should just launch straight in yeah let's do it I think let's yeah. do it okay yeah <laughs> um yeah if you want to carry it away I feel like that would like working out that how to like recontextualize that fringe sensibility is so massive i like I, I can't even fathom how you would go about doing that like did you kind of like map out a strategy to start with oh my gosh okay well i love you throwing to me but here's what i want to offer i feel like what we should talk about is like how to even get a show on in a fringe context mm. and then i feel like from there we should talk about how to take it to main stage because mm, there's so mm, much like juicy foundational context that I can talk on top of um, yeah, yeah, and totally. to answer your question did I have a map absolutely not but I learned a lot <laughs> along the way and so now when people come to me like what do I do I'm like sit mm. down let me tell you <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Yeah. but um, yeah, well, Liv, can, can you speak to that a bit like what happens when you've got an idea you've got like a word document on your laptop how do you take it from there to little la mama yeah well I I'm happy to field this, Mark, if you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah go um, So basically when I was doing my grad show at BCA, um, I was obsessed with La Mama and, and still obsessed with La Mama um, I, because I just love what La Mama is, represents in terms of, um, like, community building and community making and also um, their commitment to risk-taking and and creating space for failure for both young and older artists. I just love everything about that. Um, and I remember when I moved to Melbourne from Sydney, the first show I saw was at La Mama, and I remember getting out and being like, this is it, I've made it. Uh, and so I was really um, committed to the idea of doing my grad show as part of the La Mama Exploration season. For those people who don't know, La Mama Explorations is a season that La Mama runs every year, most years, uh, which is basically giving a bunch of people an opportunity to experiment and, and try out a new idea for performance uh, in like tiny three night seasons. So it's very fast and loose. Like when we went in, when my show went in, we 
got into the theatre, bumped in, teched, dress rehearsal, opening night, all in the same day. And wow, was that a day. Um, but it's really like the emphasis is upon trying things out with an audience. Um, and so the uh, process that I went through was that I pitched the work to Caitlin Dullard, who's the co-CEO, um, as part of that, uh, like uh, underneath that um, explorations umbrella. And uh, the brilliant thing and kind of unusual thing about the Lamama is that they're very open in terms of like what information you offer to them. They don't have a structured like, what is this? Give us your vision, all that sort of thing. It's very like, send us any information that you have about what you're dreaming about. Uh, and so basically I just tried to send through as much information as possible uh, whilst like trying to, you know, balance it between like making sense and also like communicating how passionate I was about this project. Uh, and so, and then it got picked up for that season. And so we um, then had a rehearsal process that was really very much um, me kind of uh, navigating my way through the way that I wanted to work, the kind of like very gut driven feeling like this was how I wanted to make work, even though I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and what that meant in practical terms was that the work that I make, I'm very interested in um, working in real time. So the plays that I've written so far all uh, are all single conversations and they take place in public spaces. So I'm really interested in like um, things unfolding in real time, like task-based action, uh, working with performers for them to feel comfortable to sit in silence uh, and to like resist action because I am really interested in the potential of conversations that kind of pass through different kinds of thresholds. And so uh, for this rehearsal process, uh, just like t totally as guesswork, I structured it. So the first half of every rehearsal um, was about um, the actors becoming comfortable with each other and sitting together in the space, the world of the play, which was a swimming pool changing room. And I would introduce tasks into that space and it was really about the focus was on um, making them feel comfortable enough together in their bodies that they didn't feel like they needed to do anything, that they didn't feel like they needed to perform. And in the second half of every rehearsal, we would work on notes on this text that I had written. And the effect of doing these kind of like long form improvisations meant that they developed a language together as characters and they developed a history together of like coexisting in this space. And it meant that we could kind of slip that underneath the scripted scenes of the work. And if, you know, if I hadn't had that um, explorations kind of deadline and outcome, I don't think I would have been pushed to come up with this process, even though I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. But as it turned out, that process is actually now the way that I deliberately work. So every every show that we make together as an ensemble now, we do it half and half. So it's half of it is about kind of um, working out what the world of the play is by um, spending time in that space as bodies. And the other half is like focusing on the text. And so that is like, that was such an amazing first experience for me. Like that was my first show that I did in Melbourne. Um, and it really kind of allowed me to try a bunch of things and take the ones that I that worked kind of further into my practice. Yeah, so nice. that was, that's kind of that's my so go fun. on the fringe so far. How about you, Marky? How was it? How was it being at VCA? Yeah, it was great. Um, yeah, I love having a cohort to workshop stuff with, and you know, constantly. Yeah, I feel like my project was constantly evolving and getting mm. feedback from others really handy but um yeah like your process sounds really interesting and I'm curious about um like when you get actors into the room and yeah like how much you work on a text beforehand before you kind of you know launch it and bring it to others yes yeah, so because I um I write to voice so I write uh knowing who the performers are that I want to work with I mean Hilariously, that for my VCA show, I wrote the script for a performer who I did not know at the time and who I really admired, Emily Tomlins. And so I wrote this play for her, kind of really hoping that she would say yes and not be freaked out that this stranger had written a play for her. 
I remember like we found, we're best friends now. I found the email, that first email that I sent her the other day and it's very like, very formal. It's like, hello, my name is Liv Satchel and I have written this play that I would love to invite you to come and read at my kitchen table. Um, but that is the process that I've pursued since then. So I write to the performers that I know are going to be in the work uh, and uh that really means that kind of that collaborative relation that we, that we have is embedded in the text from the beginning of the process, kind of from the idea from the inception phase onwards. Uh, it means that when I'm developing the text, I do it with this same ensemble. So we have script, we kind of still do discrete periods of like script development and then rehearsals, but they're, they're all involved from the beginning. So I'm writing it to the performers in the ensemble. We do all of the script development sessions together and we are, uh, we have a very robust relationship so there's not really kind of any I don't really have any authority as the writer I, I guess would be a way to describe it which is something that I've really actively pursued it's about kind of us pulling our collective ideas and resources and skills and then it's my job to kind of turn that into text and it means that one effect of it is that um it means that there's a less kind of hard and fast border between like developing a play and then rehearsing it. It means it's kind of more on a continuous line, which which I find really useful when, when developing work. Um, and it also just means that um, I think an experience that I had when I was going through school what I, was that I was um, observing a lot of rehearsal rooms kind of from the perspective of a, an assistant director uh, and noticing that the especially the actors were a really underutilized resource. They were kind of asked to perform, but in terms of the actual skill set that they have or like the depth of knowledge or experience that they had, I realized that that was like really untapped for, you know, for different reasons. You know, there was in a main stage context, you don't have a lot of time to make a show, you know, uh, you're very resource bound. And so, but that's something that I really kind of actively pursue in my own work as a result, I think, is trying to always take stock of what everyone can do, but also kind of check in with everyone at the beginning of each new project that we do about what they want to get out of this project, like what they want to learn to do. So like really prioritizing experimentation, like the second show that we did together, I was set in a women's prison and my designer had always wanted to do a show in Traverse and my sound designer really had never done a live score for a play before and really wanted to do that. So they were, they, they were kind of two of the starting points for that project. And I find working that way kind of gives it a structure, like gives it a really structured starting position to then be like, okay, so I can write in response to these prompts or offers. Yeah, so it's kind of, it feels like it's, it's we've kind of created a little world together. Um, and it's interesting kind of because we're going to be doing the trilogy next March. It's going to be like a really clear end to this first chapter of practice. And I don't really know what's after it um but it does feel like like there is a clear I guess process that has come out of um yeah kind of working out how to work together and then coming up with a process as a result of that I have a question for you which is that um in the instance of that first La Mama show were you producing the work yourself were you working with a producer um like which one was it yeah so I've always self-produced um <gasps> and in fact this upcoming season the trilogy is actually the first time that I'm going to be working with a producer uh, because I realised I was like, I only have so many resources in this one body and doing three yeah. shows at once means that I think I'm going to have to, <laughs> just going to have to Maybe you just need to be bit. the writer. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I have always self-produced. So with that VCA show that I did, I, I founded my own theatre company called Vim uh, and Vim has produced those shows and has also as of this year, started presenting other people's work as well. Um, producing is like a skill set that I happen to have, which I feel really lucky about because it means that I can work quite independently. Um, but it's definitely not, um, it's not something that I take for granted because I'm aware that that is something that can really, um, I've, you know, I have a lot of friends who, we, you know, we all went through school together and they're, uh, that can be a real obstacle is kind of, um, you know, the practicalities of how you even get a show on, you know, like that sort of thing. And 
uh, yeah, so I feel, I feel really lucky that I have been able to do that. But yeah, so that's going to be another transition for me is actually kind of um, working out how to work with someone who's, whose job it is to do that. Well, on that, I wanted to ask you some really practical questions about self-producing because I've certainly right. found like with this recent work I did, you know, it's a it's about teenagers. A lot of teenagers see the show mm. and like the number one questions I get asked are really basic things like how do you get actors? How do you get mm. a rehearsal space? How do yeah. you, and I'm just wondering if you can talk us through some like really simple things of like, how did you find rehearsal space? How did you, you spoke about reaching out to that actor and that's amazing, but like how yeah. did you engage your other actors? And in terms of getting people to like, um, I without like ask you to describe describe like theater you know, marketing like like what were your key ways you got people to see the show because I kind of yeah, think yeah. like I feel I don't know about you too but I feel like self producing is this necessary part of uh, mm. emerging writerhood and actually all of this stuff is really useful to share. Yeah, totally. Just trying to think about which one to start with. It's I a guess huge it's... question, Liv. Yeah, like, yeah. Sorry. It's like, um, I guess probably the biggest thing I'd say is. Um, or I guess the biggest thing that has helped me is that the other part of my practice is in community building. So alongside creating my own work, I do a lot of work in um, setting up community platforms for uh, in the indie theatre scene here in Melbourne. Uh, so that's a lot of like um, gathering opportunities, skills development, new writing development, that sort of thing. Um, and the first program that I set up uh, kind of in that vein was in 2016, it was a program called Small and Loud. And that ended up running for, running for three years and it was a monthly new work development program. So it was basically like a scratch night that happened every, the last Wednesday of every month. And we'll work in the Workers' Club in Fitzroy for the first year and then at uh, the channel behind Art Centre. And um, that was trying to fill a gap, um, I guess, in the sector at the time, which was there was no uh, space for that was inviting the public in to see ideas for new work and to, and to give kind of structured feedback. Um, but through running that program, uh, I think we ended up working with over 300 artists and it was just the most, most, most amazing way to meet people. Uh, I feel like most of the relationships that I have now was people that I met for the first time at Small and Loud. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that people kind of, you know, set up a community platform in order to meet people, but... I feel like the most valuable thing that I learned when I was at school was that actually school, you could kind of take a leave school, but it's actually the people that you meet there that are going to really make or break your experience of working in theatre. Uh, and so it's really about, you know, I know it can be hard, feel hard and be hard, but it's like really about putting yourself out there, like, um, you know, sending that email to my friend M. I wouldn't have this body of work now if I hadn't done that. And it's about you know, seeing a lot of work uh, and I guess identifying people that you admire and for what reasons that you admire them. And then, you know, I guess like biting the bullet and saying hello or like trying to start a conversation uh, because I feel like if if you find your collaborators, that is really kind of at least 50% of the, of the job. Uh, in terms of, I guess, the more like nitty gritty practical, uh, there are uh, a big resource that I would recommend to people here in Melbourne uh, is Auspicious Arts. They're really amazing because they offer a whole ton of resources for anywhere from kind of rehearsal venues through to like contracting tips through to um, how to write a budget. And they do, they kind of scale to your skill set. So uh, from you know, you've never written budget before all the way through to this is your 15th show that you've done. Um, this is amazing. I've never heard of this resource. This is yeah, so yeah. Useful. And there's, I mean, there's similar bodies kind of across the across Australia. So there's Theatre Network Australia, which is based in Melbourne, but which is a national organisation. They have a bunch of amazing resources as well. Um, but kind of in, in each capital city, you'll find a similar body who are responsible for making resources like this accessible, especially to independent artists. And in terms of things like, um, you know, booking rehearsal venues, I I'd say the biggest tip is to like be organized and do it before you think you need to would be the, would be the biggest thing that I can say is that time will always just, you know, like that. And so if you can build a, build a, like a timeline for yourself and kind of work ahead of schedule, that's, 
I feel like that's kind of how I've managed to um, pull things off is, yeah, m- making sure that I don't leave things to the last minute would, I feel like, would be my takeaway tip. Um, Great tip. Yeah. yeah it's, uh, I mean, I, f- I st- it feels pretty straightforward, but I think it actually has a massive impact accumulatively. Like, you, if you can do things before or when you need to do them by, it just means that um, you kind of, it, my experience has been that it means that you, your work doesn't kind of get swallowed by, you know, missing deadlines and the stress that comes with that. No, I think that's a really good point, right? Because I know in my experiences when I've had to, and Maki, I wonder if you can relate, but like when I've had to wear producer hat and writer hat, so easy for all my producing things to slowly get out of sync of when I thought they'd be because they're pendant on other people and someone sends this too late. And then suddenly you're like in this insane like sprint to get everything Mm -hmm. done. You're like, wait, I have no time like to put my writer hat on Mm. and think and like it's a really great piece of advice yeah what are the big things that you feel like you learned through your fringe circuit days who me well I want to ask Mark because I want to ask about um I want to what was the name of the title of your piece again it was the coolest title Uh, it's (laughs) trash pop butterflies down sounds paradise but um since it's so long you can call it trash pop that's the nickname we can you tell us everything about (laughs) the development of trash pop and and like bringing that to stage yeah definitely so um that was my graduating piece at dca um and i'm really interested like it was so great to hear from you Liv, because my process was so different it was like Uh your you know since you're a director as well um that's so interesting to me because i kind of i guess it was more of a kind of traditional process where you're kind of like hiding you're like riding away and it's all like a yeah, that, that it's, it's your legal. play yeah, yeah. And, then, and then the collaborators come in later mm-hmm. and then you find the people you're working with and then the script evolves um but there's like this whole you know 60 page script to work from already um that's been developed a lot and yeah so um that process I think and also I found self-producing kind of I, I admire that because I found it a nightmare. Yeah. I feel like it's such a different skill from writing. It's completely different. It is different. super different. Yeah. And um, I worked with uh, Amelia Burke, uh, who was the director mm-hmm. I worked with. And we kind of were self-producing together at the start. Mm-hmm. And we were like, we need to find a producer or someone to help us because this is all so difficult and confusing. <laughs> and it's all, you know, like just writing grants and finding yeah, a house space and there's so much it's like a full-time job mm. and um so we found a producer um to help us and uh, zoe who's great and yeah that was really helpful um but yeah i would say that my i i can't give advice on producing because i don't think i have my much good advice that's about. great though because <laughs> you can tell us all about the development of text and writing and are we not at a writer's festival so this is perfect now that that's what we're here for (laughs) yeah um but yeah I think developing it was really interesting like we because I think I was in this really imaginative world where I felt like I could do anything and it wasn't very logistically like Mm -hmm. a lot of things didn't make sense I was like oh in this scene a a clock will come in and start talking and then like then in this scene there needs to be like 10 people probably um and I like the show already yeah I think it was just like I kind of wrote it um not having a lot of things in mind in terms of how Mm. yeah like in terms of how many actors they would need to be to do that and like the costumes and you know how is that all going to work and then once I had that um it was a process of like refining it and thinking okay this is a indie show um, we only have so much resources to work mm. with. Um, what do I need to cut? What can we do here? And working with actors as well. And here, like, the, you know, it's so valuable to have their opinion. And it changed so much um, once we got it in the room and we were reading it through and hearing from them and how they felt about everything and you know, how they perceived the world. It's interesting, isn't it, that kind of when you're um, in that phase where you're... Um, kind of unlimited by the practicality of like sourcing resources and that sort of thing. I was having a conversation with some friends the other day about how we all love readings and going to readings because it's still at that stage where anything is possible. And my friend was talking about um, 
wishing that there was a uh, um, a movement of theatre that existed called the Theatre of the Mind, where, which would be a theatre just for readings. I just thought that was the most brilliant idea because they, I think that's why I love going to, like, works, work, you know, work and development showings and readings and all those sorts of things because it is everyone kind of imagining into this shared idea rather than kind of being limited by, like, we can only afford two actors, you know. Mm. Like I the other day was talking about, kind of the, I guess, the, like, climax scene in the show that he was making uh, is this dream sequence where the lead character is being terrorised by her teddy bears, but they turn into these giant bears that then all set on fire. And he was he, he was talking to his dramaturg about it, and the dramaturg was like, so you know in, like, in the real world this scene can't happen, but that's not your problem to worry about because you're the writer. <laughs> <laughs> like I think I feel like there's something so beautiful about that like speculative stage when you're like anything's possible and I'm going to write what is in my brain yeah what? it was always fun as a writer to be like I'm gonna just write this and then give it to someone and, and then, then worry about, about it later <laughs> <laughs> I love it yeah. what, what about you what I'd offer, well I would say with that teddy bear example what's so exciting is like the imagining of that, like the imagined mm. image of that is almost more powerful than anything you could exactly. achieve than anything and like yeah. what an right and like what an exciting invitation to go okay so how how do we put this on the stage in a way that like gestures to it Mm. yeah and I remember Um, a long long time ago um I was working as an intern at Player in Australia and I did this workshop that Declan Green came in and spoke at in terms of this exact thing of like what it means to make an offer of a world as a writer and that he, at the time, he was really leaning kind of like really heavily in, into that. And it was like the stage directions that I I want them to be an offer to the people who are making the work. I don't want it to be like, it needs to be this, but I want it to be like an invitation. And so he was talking about writing stage directions in like this um, action that needs to happen should be in the spirit of an eagle stealing a fish. And he said this thing, I was like, I was like, I just, I remember my like, tiny young mind being blown because I was like that's so that's so brilliant as like a form of collaboration of like if you as a writer are not worried about kind of your vision being executed exactly as you have imagined it then actually like that's such a brilliant way to invite collaboration is to use uh I guess like that scale of vision of, of like imagining impossible things actually as like an offer or a starting point for the people who are making your work yeah I think stage like directions is a really interesting thing and I think that um I love that as well I think with a a lot of the stage directions I wrote um for this for this project Mm -hmm. instead of being like it needs to be exactly like this there's going to be a dance sequence where they put the arms in there and it it was just kind of I would write something like the dance choreography here um should have like a purple mysterious tone or something like that that. the director can take and think okay what mood I know the mood and um, how am I going to create that kind of thing. Yeah, it's like an invitation to, like, create the feeling of something rather than the exact sequence itself. Yeah. Mm. I think that's a really good idea. I certainly found on Fangirls, this musical that I wrote, um, because I worked on it for so many years. Mm. I think this year or no, next April will be seven years since I started. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Right. It's wild, hey? Um, but it really took so, so long to, like, expensive things take time, turns out. Yeah. Um, but it didn't <laughs> <knew? take> I, ref- <laughs> I reflect that my early stage directions, probably because I self-produced a lot of my, o- my early work, my early yeah. stage directions were really practical. It would be, like, if there was, you know, if someone was joined by backup dancers, I would describe how many backup dancers, what they were wearing, and, like, mm. I guess as a way to sort of define for myself and anyone who might read my work, like, it's not 20, it's four. It's affordable. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's okay. I've thought of it. It'll be fine. It. <laughs> right. But what was beautiful is I ended up working with um, uh, Paige Rattray, the director of the show, oh. who is incredible and who really pushed me to go feral and weird. And my stage direction started to become like, so-and-so appears. They are Britney Spears. There's nothing you can tell them. <laughs> like, um, they are surrounded by, like, a million backup dads. Like, I would start to give these more... Um, like emboldened gestures or yeah. like the internet explodes on stage <laughs> because I started to realize that if, yeah, if you give these challenges to like mm. a great directorial mind, they'll totally surprise you with what they, yeah, they come yeah. back with. And I certainly found that to be true with Paige. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, I, also, hearing both of you describe the processes of bringing these, these works to stage, mm. there's so much of what you're describing that is really familiar to me. And then mm. also, like, to your earlier question, Liv, it was very interesting getting Fangirls made. There was a point at which, like, my experience, like, mm. in producing things in a fringe context, there was a point in which, like, that, that knowledge ran out. And I ended up going into this, like, <laughs> uncharted land. We hit like, the cliff's edge. Like, <laughs> exactly. So I'd love to speak to up to and then over the cliff's edge. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. Producing in professional context. Yeah. All right, so... So making Fangirls, the way that that work began is that I won um, a grant that was called the Rebel Wilson Theatre Maker Scholarship at ATYP. I think it's now called the Rebel Wilson Comedy Commission, but it was the first year it was run. And it was a grant for $10,000 for someone under 26 who had like a dream idea. You pitched it directly to Rebel and then she she selected my project that year. And I had desk space at this company, access to their rehearsal rooms. And at the end of the year... um, they, well, what they were going to do is at the end of the year, they were going to do like a kind of drinks thing for their donors and supporters where myself and then the Rose Byrne, the person who won mm. the Rose Byrne scholarship, there were two of us, we were each going to give like a 20 minute talk about what we had done that year um, to the donors. There'd be free wine and they'd be like, oh, well done. So I spent the year creating um, this idea for fangirls, which um, for anyone listening who needs context, it's like this musical, but it's also kind of like, a pop concert meets rave meets church. It's got a girls' choir in it. It's got like this big pop soundscape, um, and so like the, the the scale of ambition for the work was huge. Oh. And I spent the year um, writing it and and making like a few demo songs. And at the end of the year, when they said, you know, you can do a twenty minute speech in front of a room full of people, I thought to myself. I'd spent this year making this work that to me kind of felt like fan fiction. I really thought it would never get on. I really mm. thought it was sort of just for me. And I thought, well, this is my one chance to maybe hear this music. So I said, actually, can I have a 45 minute slot? And can I do a mini concert of like six songs from the show mm. and talk in between and create a vision for the audience about like what I feel this could be? And can I try to use this to invite some main stage producers, not thinking they'd necessarily pick the work up, but that it would be an interesting calling card of like, oh, that girl's got some weird ideas. So then I was really lucky that um, the general manager at A2AP at the time, a woman named Annie Maiden, who's an incredibly skilled producer. And she was like, if you're going to do that, film it. And not only film it, but film it with like high quality sound recording. So not just a mic of the room, but like Mm. a desk recording of the sound that's going through the desk. So once I kind of had that on side, I said, I thought, oh, well, I should make this the, my, the best possible calling card I can. So I ended up getting eight people to sing with me. So there's nine of us. I had to wow. use my producing skills to buy cases of beer for tech managers at various companies so that I could get nine mics, nine mic stands, nine mic cables, nine music Yikes. stands. Um, I ended up deciding that I wanted projection at some point. So I had to borrow like a huge, it wasn't a normal projection screen. It was like a cinema screen. And then like a projector, like I just, it was bigger than Ben Hur. It was absurd. And actually a lot of people commenting like, Eve, it was supposed to be a 20 minute speech. And I was like, no. Um, uh, and then my friend, Alex Blanche, who's an incredible director, also trained as a lighting designer, is an old friend. And uh, he's like, yeah, I'll come in and I'll light it. And he comes in with like a smoke machine, makes the whole thing look like a Beyonce concert. <laughs> anyway, this presentation was 45 minutes long. I think we spent a couple of afternoons rehearsing it with this Mm. incredible gang of folk. Um, But then performing it for a room of about 100 people Mm. who were there because there was free wine and who thought they were sitting to watch a speech, like when the bass, like, boom, boom, they went wild, all to say, like, we ended up having a video of a very warm crowd really Mm. appreciating this complete surprise. And that 45 minutes of footage completely changed my life because um amy my advocate at atyp firstly she invited like belvoir stc Mm -hmm. all of these big players but then she took the footage and sent it to like stc who didn't show up the people from belvoir who couldn't make it and all these main stage companies across the country Mm -hmm. um and i'm so lucky i had that advocate with some message like listen if you don't watch this you're an idiot you should see what it is and then very fortunately, within like a short, a pretty short mm. amount of time, a lot of people were reaching out being like, oh, this is quite interesting. And what I learned, I think really helped us is that every main stage company in the country 
um, who's receiving money from a government or a funding body, mm -hmm. they've got one of their remits is they have to create new audiences. They have to create, they have to find people yep. who aren't already going to theatre and bring them in, mm. right? Because we all know that theatre in main stage con contexts is largely patroned by old rich white mm. people. They're mm. going to die. They need new people. And mm. so w even though I thought this idea was completely uncommercial, unprecedented in terms of like, why would anyone take mm. a work from an unknown woman? Uh, it was interesting to understand like, oh, I have a work that potentially could bring in brand new audience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so I mm -hmm. had power I wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. And so it was very interesting then seeing how much interest there was. And then of course, because there was this influx of interest in December, 2016, I thought, Oh great. So like the show will be out in 2017. Like my work is done. It's easy. <laughs> Not the <case. laughs> yeah, easy. But I actually came to learn like, you know, to get a show programmed at a company takes way more than, 12 mm. months because they they program on these annual basis and like um like Belvoir for example were really interested and I was really interested to work with them nonetheless we started conversations in early 2017 about them wanting mm. to work on the show and I was like great where's my contract and they're like no no it doesn't work like that like we have to talk for a while before we decide yeah. if we're really going to commit there was a process whereby um, I took a meeting with Belvoir, which was going to be my pitch of getting them to take on the show. And I just, used, I applied the same philosophy for the showcase. And I said, okay, for this pitch, it's not going to be in the office. It's going to be in your rehearsal room and I need access to the PA. And I did this, like, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but this unhinged kind of one woman version of the show with my laptop where I hit play on all my demo songs <laughs> and talked through the scenes and what happened. And I like, got them to bring like so many staff members and made it like really vibey but all of I'm 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 kind of going down some tangents but all this is to say that I learned in a fringe context yeah. you can produce your own work you can be like I'm doing it this is how big it is let's go in a main stage context you've got gatekeepers with money and to unlock yeah. that there was just a lot of pitching there was a lot of pitching a lot of persuading and a lot of like coming to understand what did they want to see in a work? And like mm. um, a big piece of advice I give people in grant applications is like, great if you know why you want to make the work, but to unlock the money, you've got to understand um, what they're looking to fund and what mm. they want to exist. So come, mm. coming to understand like main stage companies and like, what are they trying to do? What's the, what, mm. is the, what is the core vision of their company? Like, what do they want to deliver in each season? And how can you go to them and go, oh, I've got everything you were ever looking for. And so, yeah, it was like a big process of pitching. Finally, we did a deal, deal together. And then there was like the further development of the work, which is kind mm -hmm. of like a whole nother kettle of fish. Wow, what a wild ride. That is exactly what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was a wild ride, yeehaw. I, yeah, I must have, did it feel... Um... I'm just trying to like imagine into so you know with such um uh like extensive fringe experience as well I'm just trying to imagine into like what autonomy means in that context like in terms of um like how much control you had over the creative vision for the show how that worked in terms of like collaborating with someone like Paige and also I guess like those you know those restrictions I guess of main stage context which is you know time money um hitting audience targets all of those sorts of things were there ways that you found to kind of like I guess like exist within that system that felt I really like that question I think I also want to say that like although it was a really intense ride getting it produced I have nothing but love now for Belvoir because they, mm. and, and all of the partners, because they really like made our dreams come true. Mm. And there was like, there was certainly in the early days, this like interesting friction of exactly what you're talking about. Mm. I was used to having full control. If you produce mm. your own work, you decide what the publicity image is. Mm -hmm. You decide everything. And so, you know, when I did my deal with Belvoir, I was like, I would like to approve every piece of marketing copy. I would like to, and like, I asked, I just, I asked for a lot of things that, I understand were pretty not customary and yeah. I can imagine that I can, I would just imagine that as a company is like who is this random 24 year old I think it's done, but we don't give we don't do this like that's so annoying yeah. to send her all the marketing I don't I don't know and I'm totally projecting maybe that's not how they felt um but it was interesting right when there was like 
there was the brochure shoot for the show and I was flown mm. to Brisbane to do the Queensland brochure shoot and then I did it in Sydney and I was like great I've made a Pinterest board they're like that's not how it works you're going to show up <laughs> and we, we, we have a we have hired a brand agency they've picked the image you're going to show up and you're going to take the photo and I was like mm. excuse me <laughs> Yeah, interesting because, um, and like there was stuff like that where I just didn't know. I'm used to a fringe mm. thing where it's like, all right, let's call a friend who's a photographer, let's get a studio, let's go, or like let's shoot it in the driveway. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. So that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and, but like, but also then in hindsight, there were moments where I was used to having control and then I was surprised mm. when I didn't. But there's also so much stuff they did that I'm so grateful I never mm. had to think about or deal with. Like uh, when the scale of producing a musical, it's like, oh my God, think about like the sound design. You've got to hire yeah, yeah. microphones. What if one breaks? Like every night I would go out on, look, I was in the original season and I would go out with this mic that was two microphones taped together in case one died and there was no time to oh change it out of it. Like the intricacy <laughs> of what they had to produce was like extraordinary. Mm, mm. And they crushed it. Like the show was a hit in no small part due to just how hard they advocated for it mm. and marketed for it. But taking like a slightly different direction, what I thought was also really interesting was understanding how the processes whereby like work is developed in main stage contexts. Because mm. I had, before I did the deal with Belvoir and all of the partners, um, my processes of developing the work were working with my incredible dramaturg, Johnny Ware. And that mm. looks like sitting at a dinner table with my laptop open that looks like getting out index cards and mm -hmm. structuring the work together. And it also looks like getting a bunch of my friends around cooking pasta, mm. feeding them wine and being like, can you just read this aloud for me? And mm. that was like, I still reflect that that was one of the most useful parts of my process was just repeatedly getting friends and usually friends who weren't actors to mm. sit around and just read my work aloud. And it, it like, it was kind of important to put people in roles who would never play those roles who like, just so I could just hear the text. Mm -mm. Um, and then it was interesting. That's how the process really began and how I started developing the work. And then once I partnered with these companies, a workshop looked like Monday to Friday, everyone is being paid. 10 to 5 full tech in a room mm. which was extraordinarily helpful but also I'll just I guess what I want to offer is that early in my career I probably would have looked at my development processes and been like it must be so much easier when it's resourced and yes to a degree however like resources also come with pressure and they mm. come with like I remember this workshop we did in Brisbane which was unhinged where like on Monday we read the work together on Tuesday, that me, Paige, and like two dramaturgical people sat in a hotel room all day completely restructuring the show. Wednesday, from like truly 5 a.m. to 11 p.m., I had to completely redraft a 126 page script, wrote three new songs in that day. I don't know how that day happened. <laughs> Thursday, was Thursday was teaching the new work, and Friday was presenting the new work. And I look no. back at that and like, uh, uh, like I'm amazing. <laughs> But there was no elasticity because it's like yeah, yeah, we've yeah. flown everyone to Brisbane, we've paid everyone to do this. Yeah, this is it. Let's go. The time yeah. is now. Yeah. So mm. I've I've gone on a thousand tangents, but I guess mm. what I want to say is if you are an emerging writer and you have a work and you want to get it developed, it's so easy to go, I need to apply for a grant so that someone mm. with a rehearsal room and a company can pay me and my friends to work on it. However, it's also true that you, if you've got friends who are writer peers who've got a Tuesday free, a Tuesday night free, you can just get them to sit mm. around and read your stuff out loud. And so long as you do it in a non-exploitative way that everyone's happy to do it, it you can make it mutually beneficial and you can all rework mm. for each other. There are really resource light ways mm. that actually on reflection are some of like the best parts of my development process mm, with mm, the cheapest mm. ones. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, yeah, that really resonates with the, a lot of the kind of community programs that I've been involved in. Um, my company, Vim, uh, ran this program for two years called Dinner and a Show, which was very much what it said on the label. Basically, I was really interested at the time in what the, like, ritual of a shared meal could do for new writing. And so uh, kind of from month to month, writers, writers would approach us uh, with like I've got a first or second draft of a new idea I'm working on and I'm, I'm kind of at the point where I really need to hear it read um, and so 
we'd uh, contact actors on their behalf, invite everyone over to our house, we'd read the play and cook everyone dinner and share a meal and and then we would facilitate feedback whilst eating. And it was just such a simple and effective way to actually cover a massive amount of ground. It's like, like you say, Eve, it's so resource light but actually has such makes such a huge difference, particularly at that stage of work, you know, when you're still in that sort of like associative dreaming stage and you just need to hear what it's potentially starting to mean to other people. I don't know if you've had that experience, Marky, of kind of that more, I guess, like flexible approach that, yeah, I guess feels more possible kind of pre, pre-professionalization. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's great. Like you realise it's actually so easy to do a lot of the mm-hmm. steps for development yourself and yeah, totally. um, yeah like there's a lot of freedom in indie shows mm. and that like you can kind of just like let's meet in a park let's meet in my house like you know mm-hmm. you can just use your friends use your random yeah. like whatever you have on hand mm. and you can do so many of the first phases of a show um yeah and I guess but like you know having someone like a big company taking care of stuff sounds nice too <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sound, yeah i mean it does sound pretty good can, yeah having the microphones having the lighting having the sound oh don't get me wrong i'm so grateful be dreamy. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah as well mm. yeah. well do we want to maybe uh just like do one final final roundup of like maybe any like pointers or offers maybe in terms of people mm. starting to think about taking their writing onto a stage somewhere yeah, I think it's a great idea, Liv. Do you want to start us off? Yeah, uh, I guess uh, I want to say that uh, I've been really lucky because I also work as a director. It means that I haven't had to wait for someone to approach me about putting my work on stage. Uh, I've done it myself. Uh, but I do, uh, yeah, I guess want to invite people to feel empowered in in starting that conversation. Uh, I think often writing can feel really um, disempowering and like quite isolating because, you know, you're by yourself at your desk having all these ideas and not actually sure, like once you've written them down, whether they're going to go anywhere. And I, yeah, I guess I just want to um, say that uh, writing is actually, you know, a really specific skill that a lot of people don't have and that you should feel like you are, um, you have something to offer and that you're not just waiting for someone to like do you a favour. Uh, yeah. So but like be be empowered and start the conversation would probably be my biggest thing because there are people who will want to collaborate with you. Um, yeah, I can go. I think, yeah, don't be precious with the text, I think. Um, mm. Go for it. Get actors in early. Find good collaborators that you get along mm. with both artistically and personally um especially if you know you're you're you have the position where you can choose your collaborators um that's really special uh especially within you know fringe context you're in control and you can Mm. you know find the people that you want to work with um yeah and hear it out loud early um Mm. and I think like being open to change like and just feeling like okay this is just a start I think that for me the text is the beginning. Um, it's like mm. a seed and then there's so many layers that come on top of that and you'll be surprised with, you know, what other people can bring to the table um, and being open to that and, yeah. Yeah, I love that. That, that responsiveness, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so important. But it is, like, such a skill. Like, being being open to feedback, I think, is a really, yeah, it's a really uh, amazing thing to track kind of your growth around. I really agree. And I was going to say, like, I really love that point, Maki, about Don't Be Precious. Mm-hmm. I think a huge reflection I have is in the early days of Fangirls. I cared about it so much. I invested so much time. I'd be so careful to show little bits of it to people. And, you know, if they liked it, I'd be like, oh, thank goodness. And if they even raised a question about it, I would spiral and be like, well, if they don't get my work, then I've wasted my life. And there's no point that I have mm-hmm. to kill them. I, I took things so personally. Mm-hmm. And now... Pfft, seven years in if someone doesn't get something I'm like oh great then I, I'll just change it like I've just I'm, I haven't been clear enough mm. and um I agree like it's interesting to track your growth around it but I guess yeah my advice to early writers or emerging writers is like 
don't take feedback too personally and don't be afraid to set really clear um, containers or boundaries if you're sharing mm. your work around like the kinds of feedback you want and the kinds of feedback you don't want. You know, with those dinner table readings, I can't remember, we had these like sentence beginnings of like, what we'd like to know at the end is like, what what didn't you understand or what questions do you have? Um, and like which moments like really lit you up or made you care, you know, so that we could understand mm. what was working and what wasn't working. Um, so yeah, that would be some advice that I offer. Um, also, before we close, I just want to encourage anyone watching, you can check out the rest of the National Young Writers Festival digital program over on nywf.com.au. Nailed it. <laughs> Did it. <laughs> it's been, been such great. an absolute yeah. treat to yeah. spend a bit of time with you all. Um, and I wish you well with your future writing endeavours. Yes, you too. Yes. I want to see both your yes, shows. Oh, Liv, I want to see the um, the triple bill. Oh man, it's happening. We'll be I'll there. I'll let you know about it. Handmade merch. We'll be there. <laughs> yeah, baby. And thank you, incredible, incredible show, Marky. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you too. Yeah. All right. All right. Is that it? Yeah. The end. The end. <laughs> <laughs>